So in the space of the room around you, imagine that space is also within you. And that any way that you are right now, there's space for you to be the way you are. In the beginning of this meditation, you might spend a little bit of time feeling and sensing, discovering how you are now. Maybe letting your attention roam around in your body, in your heart, in your mind. To do two things, to recognize what is here for you, how you are, what's happening, and to sense or feel whatever is happening is happening in a field of space. A field of awareness, capacity for awareness that perhaps is not troubled by how you are, that is aware kindly, the kind of awareness that you're aware and supportive of yourself. Supportive of this life, this expression of humanity that you are, and then if there's some simple ways that you could soften and relax your body to soften the muscles of your face, relaxing around the eyes, the cheeks and the jaws, Softening the shoulders. Relaxing the belly, having the belly hang forward and out. And then also perhaps softening or relaxing any tension associated with being mindful. Relaxing the thinking muscle, the muscle of mental effort, if there's tension or pressure or expectation, or any tendency to judge oneself or be critical of oneself, if that could be relaxed for these few minutes here. And to give yourself the assumption of goodness, the assumption of care, kind attention. And then with that miracle of awareness, specialness of attention, to receive the sensations of breathing. First, to simply familiarize yourself with the experience of breathing.
and then to open yourself to receive more fully the experience of breathing. Almost as if your whole body was to receive the movements of breathing, the sensations of breathing, To sit here in the samadhi of simply aware of breathing. The torso expands as you breathe in. It expands somewhat in all directions. And the torso comes back, contracts again as you exhale. As you exhale, maybe letting go of your thoughts. And as you let go of thinking, let go into the body's experience of breathing. Letting go of thoughts and that space in the mind that was thinking, let it fall into, settle into a greater intimacy with breathing. Gently give yourself over to being just aware of the body breathing. But if something takes you away from that, you wander off in thought or something else happens, no need to fight that or condemn that. Rather learn the art of being soft and resilient. And softly begin again with your breathing. Like the leaves or branches of a tree, they allow themselves to be pushed by the wind and then they come back.
the rhythms of breathing has an influence on your body, an influence on your mind, your heart. See if you can allow or trust the influence that breathing has on you. Entrust yourself to the breathing, even if the breathing is uncomfortable. Relax and trust the process of breathing. Allow the breathing to have its gentle impact on you.
as we come to the end of this sitting, you might reflect for a few moments on how the experience of meditation, the simplicity of being, any degree of calm, contentment you have just sitting here, your ability not to be constantly entertained or to do things, how it might support you and those around you in these challenging times, especially for the people whose lives are seriously reduced to staying at home or staying in their immediate neighborhoods. To allow our calm and our contentment with simplicity of being that needs so little in order to be happy. May it be a support for ourselves and for the world around us. May all beings be happy. May all beings be free. May all beings live without suffering. So good morning again, and I'll give the fourth talk that uh, I have on this short series on faith, on the Pali word sada. And each day I'm doing a different aspect of faith. And the first day, Monday, was faith itself, and then confidence, conviction, and today it's trust. And the traditional idea of faith in Buddhism is that the sada is what gets us started on practice. As we practice, it's useful to develop confidence and have confidence in the practice and our ability to practice. As we practice, there becomes a conviction that this works, that this is valuable, this is worthwhile. And then as we continue in the practice, it's possible to discover a very deep trust. And the aspect of that trust is multifaceted. There could be trust in the Dharma, the Dharma being something that's clearly larger than ourselves or deeper than ourselves or our self-concept, the identity we run around with, the sense of our, me, myself, and mine being the agent, have agency. These are all valid, but it's also valid that there's much more that supports our lives. And the Dharma, they say the etymology of the word Dharma comes from the word to support, that which holds up something. And so we are also supported and held up by something that Buddhists will call the Dharma. And as we practice and discover how to relax, be present, be carefully attentive, we discover that there's more going on here within us, in a sense, um, deeper processes and patterns of life that uh, are deeper than anything that we could engineer or organize or make happen on our own. And the analogy I like to give is, uh, uh, you, you know, it's possible to be maybe working in the kitchen and cutting vegetables and cut your, cut your finger with a knife. And, uh, you know, you, cl- and uh, you have then the, the job of 
maybe cleaning the wound and perhaps protecting it and putting a bandage over it so it doesn't get dirty. But the actual healing is not something we orchestrate. It's not something we engineer. The healing of that wound uh, marshals together many, many aspects of our physiology, our immune system, um, our healing capacities. And, uh, and it's a kind of a miracle, kind of special, how all this complicated probably phenomena come together in the body without us having to think about it too much or without engineering or uh, directing the show. Our job is mostly to keep it clean and protected so the natural functioning of the body can uh, operate. It also works like way, that way for our hearts, it works that way for our inner spiritual life, that uh, we have to keep it clean, we have to protect it to some degree, uh, and that's one of the functions of uh, precepts and ethics. It's one of the functions, one of the things about living a calm, settled, relaxed life, so that a uh, little bit we're, we're protecting and creating the good circumstances that something can arise within us. Uh, certainly the powerful healing processes of the heart. But more than just healing, it's also a unification, a gathering together of all the different disparate parts of who we are. And they have a chance to, the puzzle pieces of our life has a chance to click back together, to reassemble in the way that life disassembles the wholeness of who we are. And this process of coming into wholeness is a natural process that our inner system knows how to do, just like it knows how to heal a cut. And, uh, and to trust that deeper process of coming into wholeness, uh, to trust how Dharma practice, for example, uh, enables that and makes room for that and allows for it. But it's more than just becoming healing or more than just becoming whole. There's also an inner process, an inner unfolding towards freedom and liberation itself. And, um, and there also, at some point as we practice, uh, you know, when we first begin practicing, we have to make a lot of efforts. We have to learn, the med- learn what the meditation is. We have to sit down. We have to keep doing it and come back. But as we begin settling more and more and we get into the momentum of the practice, then less and less agency is needed from us. At some point, what's mostly needed is uh, we have to do the work of keep getting out of the way, getting out of the way, not interfering, not trying to make things happen and do things. And at some point, that tipping point from a time when we have to make the initial effort to a time where really we just almost no effort from us is needed, but there's a deeper wellspring of effort, of energy, of momentum, of of the path of practice begins to unfold inside of us. And to trust that, to trust that there's something really good happening here, that um, uh, it's not really up to us to do, but it's for us to trust, to get out of the way. And it's a phenomenal thing to discover this trust and really understand through one's own experience that all the things that surface in meditation, even things that are difficult, and all the things that are good in meditation and wonderful, that um, there's a deep kind of intelligence that knows what needs to appear, that knows what's appropriate now for us to face and to work with and to work through. And so to trust this process of our life, to trust what unfolds in our life, what appears in our life from the inside out, but also in a certain way, even to trust what comes from the outside in, what happens around us, is one of the potentials of sada, of faith. In some ways, logically, it might not make uh, logical sense that we trust everything around us, but uh, for someone who practices and understands the deep wellsprings of intelligence, of wisdom, of processing, of healing, of movement towards wholeness and freedom that exists, um, it's when when that process has a chance to meet the circumstances of the life around us, the external circumstances, it begins to transform that interface, the meeting place between us and the world. Maybe the world doesn't change, 
uh, directly, but something happens in that interface that makes the situation better. Sometimes it does influence what happens outside. Someone comes to you and you're, and you're angry, and they're angry, and you're able to meet that with the trust that it's okay to open to it and be present. So some deeper wisdom of how to meet the angry person arises. That person might change as a consequence of that. That's very different than if we're equally reactive as the angry person. So at some point, sada becomes a, a, a more characterized by, a, we, now we know there's something that we can trust. We know there's something that's supporting us in our lives that um, is really good. And it's not exactly personal, but it is within us. It's not exactly what we you normally would identify as me, because it's not something we necessarily do, but it's certainly something which is intimately part of who we are, close and valuable and powerful. It's not something that we only we ourselves have, but everyone has this if they tap into it, if they open to it, that they allow this process to come into being. And to trust this depth of what is possible, and also to trust it in other people, to see it as something beautiful and valuable in others that maybe they don't even know. And sometimes giving space to other people and getting out of their way, not interfering with them too much, but giving space, sometimes it enables something deeper in them to surface. Uh, Buddhists might call it the Dharma. Other people might call it something else. But something, again, that's living in them, that's more coming out of the wholeness of the human being as opposed to the, the kind of the smallness or the, the much more limited domain of who we are that is represented by our attachment to self, our self-preoccupation, um, the idea that it's all about me, myself, and mine, I have to do things. That's a brittle world. That's a world that we can't really trust. But to trust this deeper place, the Dharma, I think it's a little bit hard, I feel it's a little hard to articulate this. Uh, and maybe uh, it's really mostly something we discover for ourselves over time. And, um, and so as this practice develops and deepens, it starts with faith, inspiration, some confidence, some conviction. <clears throat> and then when the time is right, we discover something, we recognize something that is trustable, that we can trust. And then <clears throat> the task of practice, that what we can do, because there's always some role that we have, when we start trusting something that's trustable, <clears throat> what we can do is we can trust it. Or perhaps more interestingly and more challenging is we can begin recognizing all the unhelpful things we're trusting in our lives. Even though most people don't use the language of trust this way, but in some sense people trust um, their they trust um, their anger sometimes, or they trust their sadness, or they trust uh, their money or bank account, or they trust the economic system, or they trust um, if they get the right relationship, everything will be good. Or there's all these things that people are oriented towards attached to or looking towards this can be the solution, how they're going to be happy. And one way of understanding that kind of looking and wanting or expecting external things to make us happy is we do grant it a certain kind of trust. We trust that that's what's going to do it. So at some point, as we begin discovering something really trustworthy within, trustworthy, something like the Dharma, the task of practice is to begin seeing what is it we trust that's not so helpful, not useful, or not even maybe accurate. And, and then learning to come back to the place that we trust, to let that be the foundation of our lives, to open to that, to allow for that, to begin to reorient ourselves almost to a new life, a life where the depth of our the depth of the Dharma within us, the depth of our humanity, the depth of our goodness has a chance to surface and grow and be. 
it's in, in this regard, it's a little bit interesting to uh, think of that um, the, our emotional life has basically two layers, two levels. There's the afflictive emotions, those that which cause suffering, anger and greed and things like that. And those um, uh, are actually quite activated emotions. They're more like surface activities of our life. They're loud. And what we're looking for in the Dharma practice is not to reject that, but to really discover the beneficial emotions that operate in a much deeper, quieter, softer place inside of us, where there's kindness and love and generosity and equanimity and patience. And it's one of the values of trusting this deeper aspect. One of the aspects of doing this practice is so that the center of our life, what we most trust, is the depth and heart of who we are, the core of who we are in a sense, as opposed to that which is on the surface, the afflictive emotions. And then we can hold the afflictive emotions in a generous way, in a kind way, in a supportive way, and not have them control us, not have them have the upper hand. So trust, what do we trust? What do we discover <clears throat> through Dharma practice that's um, uh, really worthwhile to trust and valuable? And then how do we stay close to that which we trust? That's uh, the task of practice. So thank you all for listening and for meditating and I appreciate the sense of wide community and connection through uh, this, this vehicle of electronics that connects us all. And I appreciate that you're here and um, we'll continue this five-part series tomorrow. Thank you. <clears throat>